Welcome to Unrestrain, the podcast series from CPI. Here you can enjoy conversations where professionals on all sides of crisis and behavior management relax and open up about themselves, their workplace, and their clients. You'll get the latest tips and trends from the best in the business, so tune in often to integrate their experiences with your own. Hello and welcome to Unrestrained, the CPI podcast series. I'm your host, Terry Vitone. Today we have the privilege of welcoming our guest, former governor of Wisconsin and author, Marty J. Schreiber. Hello and welcome, Marty. Well, good morning. What a pleasure it is for me to be here with you. Thank you. Also joining us today is the Director of Sales Operations for Dementia Care Specialists, the Division of CPI, Virginia Plants. Hello and welcome, Virginia. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Today we're going to talk about my two Elaines, learning, coping, and surviving as an Alzheimer's caregiver. This is the story of Marty's journey as a caregiver as Elaine's Alzheimer's progressed. And to begin today, I'm going to start by reading just a little bit from the foreword of the book. The names Martin and Elaine Schreiber will ring a bell for many in Wisconsin, especially political watchers. The story they know is that of the state's 39th governor and the first lady. Since 1962, when Martin won his first political race for state senate, they've been familiar faces on the political circuit, crisscrossing the state in campaigns for lieutenant governor, then for governor. They made an elegant couple, greeting Bobby Kennedy, President Carter, and other national leaders when they came to Wisconsin. For almost 30 years, election night usually found the Schreiber side by side, watching the returns come in for one of Marty's races, accepting the victories and the defeats with grace. Later, when his own political career had finished, Marty became one of the state's best known government relations consultants. This was the story I knew in the beginning, the one familiar to so many, but it is not the one you will find in the pages of this book. My Two Elaines is instead the story of what happened to the Schreiber's later in life, when Elaine began to show the first signs of Alzheimer's disease and then gradually but surely came under its grip. So Marty, let's begin with our first question. In the preface to my two Elaines, you write that a primary objective uh, was sharing your message man to man, but that people who review the manuscript believe it could reach a wider audience. How did this specific idea of the man and the role of a caregiver spark the idea to share your experiences in the book? I think it began with the understanding that I wasn't very bright and that um, I made any number of mistakes. Uh, men don't like to ask for directions. Uh, we're heroes. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we gather, we hunt, we do all of those things. And then when a loved one uh, comes down and, and is diagnosed with dementia, we don't realize what a challenge it is. And what happened was, with Elaine's diagnosis, I think what up until that point and maybe even today, uh, we fail to realize that there are two patients when there's a diagnosis with dementia. There's a person with dementia, then there is the caregiver. And we've got to understand that the caregiver uh, must realize they can't do it alone, but they also have to understand more of the disease. And so what prompted me to write about this is that if ignorance uh, is bad, I mean, if, if Alzheimer's is bad, worse than Alzheimer's is ignorance of the disease, and then going one step further, rather than worrying about the storm to pass, to learn how to dance in the rain. And I knew nothing about it, and I feel guilty of things that I learned too late or not soon enough. I feel badly that we could, my wife and I could have grabbed more moments of joy, and, um, it, it seemed that, that women as caregivers were better able to understand, but yet uh, many women have told me that this was extremely helpful, but, but sometimes we men are arrogant, we're self-centered, and we're too proud, and we think of ourselves as being too manly, and therefore because of that we want to do it alone, and that's a disservice to the person with dementia, and also it's a disservice to the caregiver himself, and to the family, and to the loved ones. In chapter two, uh, when Marty met Elaine, it begins with this sentence, if you believe in love at first sight, then I fell in love with Elaine Ruth Thaney in the fall of 1953. But with that as a starting point, could you give our viewers some background and history on your relationship with your Well, wife? it was Latin class, uh, and we were freshmen in, in high school. Uh, Thaney, her last name, Schreiber, my last name, we sat next to one another, and I looked at her and I said, this is the woman that I, I want to marry. This is the woman I wanted to have be the mother of, of my children. And uh, we, of course, dated, and uh, there were some times when we went to different uh, colleges and, and, and university, but through all that time, we, we stayed together. 
and uh, married now what would be considered a, an extremely young age at 21. Uh, had four children, 13 grandchildren, five great-grandchildren. And um, Elaine to this day uh, still asks me how we met. And I tell her, well, we, we met when we were freshmen in high school. And I said, not only that, I said, I knew right away that I wanted you for my wife. And not only that, I wanted you to be the mother of my children. And not only that, if any boy got within 50 feet of you, I bopped him on the head. And she looked at me and she said, you're a BSer. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so she, in fact, you know, she loves me so strongly. She was the other day she told me, she said, oh, she said, you know, she says, even my parents are beginning to like you, and I can't figure out why. <laughs> um, in the book's first chapter, Diagnosis, you write that Alzheimer's doesn't stand still. Uh, your partner will become someone you don't know, in this example, the second Elaine, and, and you will become someone you don't recognize, a caregiver. I want you to talk about maybe the transformation that happens in that role. Um, if you can envision, if we can envision a funnel, and if we can put the small part of the funnel by our eye, and we can look up, and we can see the beauty of the sky and the hope of tomorrow. Now what happens is, as the person with dementia, as that disease progresses, that funnel becomes to be inverted, and then Envision, envisioning putting the same funnel to your eye and looking out and all you see is a small hole and that then becomes the life of the person with dementia. That's all they know. They don't know five minutes from now and they don't know five minutes past. And as this disease progresses, it sort of shrinks the memory. It shrinks the memory from can't remember five minutes ago and then five hours ago and five months and five years and so on. And so it, 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 is, it is the closing in uh, the shutting down of, of the person's mind. And unless the caregiver understands that, um, everyone is in for a rough time because I no longer could expect of my second Elaine what I expected of my first Elaine. It would be foolhardy. Now, one other important point, and that is the same thing happens in the life of a caregiver. It's that same funnel. Early diagnosis, um, everything is sort of okay. You just have the diagnosis. You put the funnel to your eye, and you can see the whole world with the blueness of the sky, the hope of tomorrow. Everything is good. And as you, as you become more of a caregiver, what happens is your life shrinks. And it shrinks because you're so focused on, on it's the anxiety, it's, it's, it's the depression, and it's the grieving. It's all of those things coming to bear. And as you focus more on wanting to take care of your loved ones, that funnel again becomes inverted and all of a sudden all you see is right in front of you and that's the person with dementia. And once you get trapped into that, a shrinking world, all of your problems are greater. You lose perspective, irrational irritability, uh, less able to cope, uh, not only with your loved one, but less able to cope with other ordinary things that you'd be able to cope with in life if, if if someone tells you something and they're wrong, well, you can roll with it. But when you get trapped into that whole uh, ex experience of, of your world shrinking, it's, it's extremely unfortunate. Um, even as you're, as, as you were watching your first Elaine transition into um, Elaine as she is now, were there times then or are there times now where you still see glimmers of your first Elaine shining through that take you off, off guard? Well, certainly her, she has a, she's always gracious and uh, she still tells me, and, and then they, they think, for instance, that she may be getting better. You know, you cannot reverse Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. but they think in this case that she could be, be in the process of being reversed because they hear her tell me how good looking and intelligent I am. And so once they understand that that's happening, you know, they heard her say that and they actually wrote an article for the New England Medical Journal about Elaine getting better. Well then, um, they needed one more proof. And so they heard her call me a BSer, and then they knew they had three, they, they knew that. But, but, but she has, by the grace of God, um, she has always been pleasant and kind and always very complimentary. Um, if she would hear a guitar player, for example, I don't care what the guitar player would sound like, she would say, oh, that's a wonderful guitar player. And if she would see a, a woman walking, she would say, oh, what a, what a beautiful, be what beautiful hair you have. So she, she's always been gracious. But beyond that, uh, our communication is very limited. 
We, she asked me many times how the children are, and well, the children are at school, and that's good enough. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the conversations that we have are very, very close and, and, and just, there, there is no communication other than her hearts and souls touching and her asking questions about her parents or children and so forth, which are sort of answered in a, in a, in a quick kind of format. So she's still um, concerned about everybody else. She's, she, still, she's still concerned about taking care of everybody else in her life. She is still concerned about, about doing that. And uh, just this is a side note, but it, it goes to the point of, of how important it is to continue that, that human that, that touching of, of the soul. Um, the other day, we were having lunch and she started to cry. And I said, well, why are you crying? Well, she says, I, I'm beginning to love you more than my husband. And uh, I didn't ask her what was wrong with her turkey husband. I didn't do that. But the point is that our souls were touching for the moment and that is all that was important. And, and that is all that is important because again, the life of a person with, with, with Alzheimer's their life is just what is in front of them. And, and because of that, um, I was right in front of her. She had the feeling of security, of, of being loved. And, and I felt good because it, it meant that our communication was working. Since you're speaking of Elaine, I noticed that you, you wrote here that halfway or somewhat into the manuscript, you found some writing of hers that that you decided to include in the book. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that was sort of, um, I don't know if it was amazing, if that's a proper term, but we were ready to go to print. And having been ready to go to print, I felt I had told my side of, of the story. And I, you know, I felt pretty good about that. Well, um, I find then um, uh, some of her diaries and notes and journals that she had kept. And I began to read them and I, I felt terrible that I had felt so proud of the story I was telling and not getting into Elaine's side of the story. But when I read uh, her journals and when I understood what was, what was going on in her mind, we had cried together and we had prayed together during this course of time, but never did I understand the courage that it took for a person with dementia to continue on. And, and I think if I could have understood just a little bit more the courage that it took and her anxiety and her worry, I think I could have been a little more patient. And, and all, you know, when you go through this, you, 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 some, you, you, you forget about the person going through what they're going through and all you're feeling are the constant questions. Uh, we would go for a walk and we would come back and she said, let's go for a walk. Well, we go for another walk and I'd like to go for a walk. Well, then you can't find, you know, some car keys and so forth. And so it's the issue at hand that you become frustrated with forgetting about the person. And so when she wrote those journals, she had me understand more clearly what, what she was going through. But also so important in those journals is one of the reasons for the book. She talks about me in, in, in some of these notes are in the book about how I helped her. And I don't say that for self-grandizement. I say that so caregivers can understand that they are being foolish if they don't take care of themselves because the person with dementia is counting on them so much. Imagine feeling, being diagnosed and knowing what your future might be and then realizing that your loved one who is taking care of you is having some serious health problems. And no serious health problems come about because of all of the emotions that are, that are impacting on, on the caregiver, uh, the lack of outward experiences because the caregiver's world is shrinking. Uh, they may not continue with their exercise programs. Uh, a caregiver of a dementia person is more apt to die sooner, more apt to become sicker, more apt to have his savings challenged or her savings challenged and so on. So these notes that Elaine wrote, um, and uh, she wrote one, for example, that she's not enjoying being my wife anymore. Another one she wrote uh, in, in which she said, uh, I'm trying so hard. I'm trying so hard to be the mother and the wife I once used to be, but I can't do it and I'm beginning to understand. And, and so um, I was fortunate to find those notes uh, because I think it gives the reader a better understanding of, of, of the importance of the caregiver's health, 
but also an understanding of what the person with dementia is going through and therefore I think can put an entirely different light on it. Now, I, I want to get to one, one other point which is not directly related, and that is the book, um, I ask friends, uh, dear friends and, and, and relatives to look at the book in manuscript form. They said, we had no idea what you were going through. And getting back to the question earlier about uh, you know, husbands, why, why for the husbands? Well, because when Elaine and I would go out to eat with friends, she would fight so hard to be normal. And in fighting so hard to be normal, at the end of the evening, people thought I was the one who was having a little bit of a problem because um, they would call me up the next day and say, Elaine is so good, you know, you know she's just doing so well. Well, I didn't have the nerve to tell them what was going on the other 23 hours a day. I didn't have the nerve to tell them what it's, it's like to be in that situation. So because of that, they never felt they would be, could be helpful to me and, uh, because I never asked them. Right. And they didn't maybe know what it took out of Elaine or what it took out of you to have that to have that show for an hour. <laughs> yes, that's correct. And and then to go back to your your real lives and to have that struggle and that frustration and I mean so much love but also, you know, some of that guilt and yes. tug of war back and forth. If you take my situation, um, which has been extremely fortunate because Elaine is always gracious and kind and worried about helping other people and also because we were along uh, in, in years and also financially secure. But I know what I went through with those pluses, but caregivers are real heroes. Caregivers are truly outstanding individuals who are giving of themselves, their time, their energy, and almost unacknowledged uh, in, in heroes because nobody really understands what they are going through. It's, it's a, it's, it's, such a strong emotional experience to be losing your loved one, but then also to going through your own psychological issues as well as going through your own health issues and so on, that it, it does take its toll in so many different ways. And, and, and so it's my hope that if Alzheimer's is bad, ignorance of the disease is worse rather than worrying about the storm to pass, to learn how to dance in the rain. In other words, the more we can understand about this disease, the better off we are, everyone. And I think uh, one of the practical aspects of the book that I like quite a bit, in the int introduction you asked the reader to let you be their trail guide, in other words, to share this experience as you look back on it. And one of the ways that you accomplish this is to include graphics of post-it notes throughout the book titled, What I'd Wish I'd Known and What I Wish I'd Done. And uh, can you speak to those and why you included in those in the book? Well, again, um, things I learned too late, things I wish I would have learned earlier. And uh, I, I made a note on a, on a couple of these. Uh, I should have, uh, here's, here's a posted note. And again, this goes to all the caregivers. I should have forgiven myself for not being perfect because I was doing the best I could in a difficult situation. It is understandable to have regrets about my shortcomings, but there is no point in feeling guilty. And that is a message for, for every, um, every caregiver. And what I wish I'd done. By wishing for the past, I had deprived my wife of happiness in the moment. Even though it broke my heart, I should have let go of my first Elaine sooner so I could love my second Elaine where she is now. Uh, maybe just just one other to give to give the uh, the viewers a sense. What I wish I'd done, I should have worked to find a healthy outlet for my own sadness and fearfulness, so that anticipatory grief would limit my day-to-day -day functioning, would not limit my day-to-day -day functioning. And so, you know, you're going through it now, but then there was also the anticipatory grief, knowing what's ahead. My dad would tell me, no, don't rush to meet the future. But you go through that and you do rush to meet the future because you know what the end result is of, of this, this type of a situation. But um, these, um, you, I hope, you know, that it's possible for more people to, I call this disease not a chicken casserole disease because uh, if, if you will break your leg and you're laid up, I'll bring you a chicken casserole. But with 
Alzheimer's, people don't see that immediately disablement. You know, they just see this gradual, and, and then they sometimes, because they don't know about the disease, they begin to shy away, and then all of a sudden, both the person with dementia and the caregiver become more isolated. The more they become isolated, the closer to their world, the closer to their world, the bigger the problems that are little. Um, you also chronicle the process of going to a few different physicians, a few different specialists to narrow down the diagnosis. Looking back, do you wish that the diagnosis of Alzheimer's could have come sooner? Would that have made a difference or made things better or made them worse? Well, I, I don't know if the, it could have become sooner because when the, there, there is a test for Alzheimer's and it's a very simple one. Who's president of the United States of America? Uh, who's the neatest guitar player? All those kinds of questions. Uh, which the finest state in the Union other than Wisconsin? Other you know, than? Minnesota maybe, <laughs> yeah. but, but anyway, so, but, so they give you that test, so we, we had symptoms, Elaine was forgetting how to get to and from where she went for 15 years to, to work and help out at the Silver Spring Neighborhood Center. Um, when she was backing out of the garage, she would scrape the side of the car, which was very unlike her, her, her cooking, which was always outstanding. She forgot many ingredients or cooked too long. And so were though, there were those indications. Well, then when we tested her first, 30 or above on this score means that you're all right. 30 or below early onset. Well, she was at 28. And so, um, w w so I don't think earlier, di she wasn't along that far that there were, could have been an earlier diagnosis. But many of the notes that I wrote in here about one of the things I talk about is making a bucket list as soon as there is that diagnosis so you can continue to enjoy uh, the, the kinds of special things, uh, but then to also learn more about the disease so you know how to handle it. And uh, uh, one, one of the things which is you can't argue with Alzheimer's. If Elaine has five coats on and she's cold, she's cold. Mm -hmm. And no discussion in the world is going to convince her that five coats is enough, so easy to get another, another coat. As you just spoke now about how caregivers can sometimes let isolation uh, take them over. One of the, what I wish I'd done, what I wish I'd done note says, right away I should have taken full advantage of all that the Alzheimer's Association has to offer. Besides support groups, there's individual counseling, plus online tools and information. How did the Alzheimer's Association help you, in your words, pull it all together so you could be an effective caregiver and learn cope and survive. Alzheimer's Association is still helping me pull it all together, so to speak. And uh, it's not because they're slow on the up uptake, it's because I'm still going through the process and, and it's a journey and they're still helping me uh, in my new capacity as sort of a, uh, an administrator of caregiving rather than a director of caregiving. But, um, by going through counseling, they helped me understand some of these things like you can't argue with Alzheimer's. They helped me understand how important therapeutic fibbing is. And Elaine was very concerned about her parents. She asked me how they were. I said, they're both dead. And the shock on her face was when she realized that, you know, she hadn't properly said goodbye. And, and, and so I promised myself I would never allow that to happen again, but the Alzheimer's Association helping me understand the disease. Now she asked me how her parents are. I say, your parents are fine. And I said, not only that, they're at church and, 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 and they're happy. So that's therapeutic fibbing. And then also not getting involved in the battle of Alzheimer's. You should do this or that, you tell your loved one. Well, why? Well, not because I said so. Well, you blame it on someone else because the doctor said so. If there's keys that have to be taken away for the car, the doctor said we should be doing that. If it's good for you to be at a certain location, the doctor said you should do that. So blaming someone else and blaming someone else and therapeutic fibbing. If I would have thought about that when we first got married, can you imagine how happy of a married life we would have had because <laughs> I'd have been able to come up with all of those, you know, uh, in, 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 or even when I ran for a governor back in 1978, you know. But, uh, but the Alzheimer's Association, um, and, and it's, it's not only the, the counseling in directly there, but you meet 
other caregivers and you understand what the other caregivers are going through and and what what happens is you 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 develop through the Alzheimer's Association and going through this journey you develop a whole new set of friends not that there was anything or is anything wrong with 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 the friends before Alzheimer's but it it's a different life and so as the journey continues you get into this new world and this new world is of people like yourself who are trying to cope and, and learn and survive and sometimes thrive on the disease, as you get to that point, uh, your world begins to open up and you become more at ease and you become more understanding and you realize you're not the only one and you learn other kinds of experiences that our people are having to, to, you know, you learn more about how important music might be or you learn how important art might be or going for, I mean, um, if it wouldn't be for the Alzheimer's Association, quite frankly, I don't know where I would be physically, uh, health-wise, as, as well as just being able to, to survive. Well, and developing that community of people who are in a similar situation to you. I'm sure they, you're able to, they're able to identify with each other in a way that other people sort of um, peripheral to the situation just can't really understand, not fully. Yes. Um, I, I want to give you the same example in two instances. Same example. If, if, if we think of, uh, of an insect with the feelers and how sensitive they are, it seems that the person with dementia has so sensitive of feelings that because their world is so small, which is right in front of them, their feelings are so much to the surface and, and to the now uh, that they're ever more aware of of uncomfortableness or anxiety or fear by the person who does the visiting. But with caregivers, it seems that there is a special antenna, a special kind of, of, of sharing of, of feelings, uh, which, which brings people closer and also a more understanding of what each of, of the parties are going through as it relates to their journey. And so, yes, I may have an old friend from prior Alzheimer's, and it's, it's a friendship, but nowhere near the kind of, again, touching as I might have with another caregiver who is going through the same journey that I was going through, am going through. You say in the book that you wish you had reached out sooner. I wish I had reached out sooner. Um, huh. There's, there's any number of different things. First of all, to, to understand more about the disease, I mentioned the, the therapeutic fibbing, uh, the need to let go of my first Elaine, which is, is difficult but extremely important. Um, there's a, a chemical in the body called cortisol, and cortisol uh, is released just before your body releases adrenaline when it comes to flee or fight. And when you're under stress as a caregiver is, your body releases more cortisol. And cortisol too much in the body can have very disastrous results. <laughs> One of the least is which sometimes dementia and uh, not Alzheimer's, but a form of, of, of memory loss. But also this adds on extra weight to the body because the body's getting ready for this fighting or fleeing and that we better make sure we've got these extra calories uh, along. And so I missed all of that information. And, and I didn't un understand what was happening to me. I, I did have a mentor at the Alzheimer's Association and, and I said, do you ever sometimes just feel like screaming? He says, not only that, but I actually scream. And just hearing that other people were going through that, that same kind of experience made a big difference in my life because now I understand that I can't feel that guilty of my, my anxiety and, and my frustration and, and lack of patience because other people are going through it too. But then I wish I would have known sooner the importance of joining my wife's world, of knowing that her world, as I thought it was, no longer exists. And I, I want to share, we, we, we gave a book presentation at Barnes & Noble. And in the audience was a woman by the name of Lisa who was about 45 years old. And she told me this story and she said that what happened was her mother called her and says, you've got to come home right away because dad, who had Alzheimer's, is acting really strange. So she rushed home. And here in the middle of, 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 of the living room 
is her dad, he's casting and, and just throwing it out and wheeling it back in. So she said she stood beside him and said, what you doing, dad? Well, he says, I'm fishing. Well, what are you fishing for? Well, I'm fishing for a walleye. Well, can I join you? He says, sure. So then she started casting and, 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 and rolling in. And she said that in the years that her dad had dementia, that was one of the wor most worthwhile experiences that she have, has had in touching with her, her dad. And so now she's leaving and her mom said, what do I do if this ever happens again? And she said, Lisa told her mom, get in the boat with him. Yeah. And I wish I would have learned sooner, you know, the idea, the importance of joining the other person's world and getting in the boat with them. Sometimes behavioral issues of, of people reacting is not necessarily so much the impact of the Alzheimer's as it is the impact of, of the, the person with dementia not having whoever is there not be in their world with them. And, you know, I should argue with my wife about whether or not five coats or six coats is enough. I should argue with my wife as to whether or not she actually has bugs on her arm when she feels it in the middle of the night rather than redirection. And uh, I, I guess um, a survivor, uh, uh, in order to survive, to understand you can't do it alone and to try and join their world as quickly as, as you can, and it's so very, very painful. So that um, your experience has been that Elaine communicates through her behavior. Elaine absolutely communicates. Be you know one one of the things I learned from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, Linda Market is my counselor, and she said, "Now she says, what's bothering you?" And I said, "Well, I said I feel so guilty because I uh, um, I didn't want to go see Elaine, and I feel guilty." And she said, "Well, she says don't." I said, "Well, what do you mean don't?" Well, she said, "Elaine's or a person with Alzheimer's." Their world is so much in the present that they can sense and feel what is going on immediately in front of them. So if I come in with anxiety and worry, she picks up that anxiety and worry. And so if my goal is to make her feel comfortable and relaxed, I am accomplishing exactly the opposite by going in when I'm anxious and nervous because she picks that up. And so this whole issue of communication, like she telling me that she loved me more than her husband, uh, that, that whole issue of, 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 of communication, getting the hands and the heart to touch is more important than anything that they might say about anything. It's interesting that you note that, that those emotional antennae are so much in the present. And, and in the chapter, Being a Real Man, you write that when a man is put into the position of being a caregiver for his wife, he'll do so with a broken heart. Uh, and he'll try to carry that weight alone. I mean, how did you, did you try to mask that heartbreak then, or how did you manage that emotion with Elaine? Well, I don't know if I did uh, manage that emotion very well in the beginning. I bought a lot of roses and a lot of boxes of candy for people that I became irrationally irritable with. And um, again, to go back to the funnel and to what's immediately in, in front of you, my world was closing. A person who has a very closed world is more apt to be offended quicker and lack objectivity and, and feel more put upon. And so, again, if it would not have been for the Alzheimer's Association, I wouldn't have understood how important it is to share. And again, we men are not very bright. We don't like to ask directions, but we also don't like to show our emotions. And uh, uh, whether it's the loneliness or it's the heartbreak, um, and so finally, uh, in my situation, my health was so bad that people said, look it, you've got to do something. And so um, once, once we figured the, the health issues and then also the emotions of, of going along with this, with the, with the anxiety and the, and the grieving and, and, and the heartbreak, once we sort of got that squared around, um, life has been uh, a little bit easier. But there again, I want to emphasize that caregivers are real heroes and that uh, they're going through heartbreak and all of the other feelings and emotions that I described. And because of that, they're, they're, they're just outstanding, courageous people. You referred to yourself at one point in the book as a widower with a wife, which I, 
I could see some people sort of thinking, oh my goodness, uh, that, that's a big thing to say. But I imagine that is something that resonates quite a bit for people who are caregivers like you and for people who are sharing that experience. Um, my first Elaine is gone. And uh, with all uh, the pain uh, and uh, and so because she's she's gone, I, I just have to have to move on. But she's still my Elaine, and so um, it's it's almost like I have two Elaines: the one that I married and shared my life with, and then another Elaine, which is maybe mentally three to five years old and uh, uh, still married to both Elaines. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never begrudge that. Uh, but um, w one of the things that really is a challenge, and I think one of the reasons caregivers have such a difficult time emotionally and I want to be very careful how I say this because I don't ever want to hurt anyone or offend anyone. But if, if there is a sudden death by heart attack, there is an immediate acknowledgement for the grieving. Mm -hmm. And there is almost an immediate closure because you know for better or for worse that person is gone. And because of that, life, better or for worse, continues for those that are surviving. With, with Alzheimer's, there many times is not the acknowledgement because people really don't understand what you're going through, but then there also really is never closure. It's, 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 it's a constant kind of, of changing and watching this person devolve, and I won't use the word evolve, but, but, but change in, into, into someone different. And, and so you don't get that closure. And, and so you, 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 you try and, and, and work it out as, as, as best you can. But I think if more of us caregivers could understand that somehow or another this whole area of bereavement is something we have to work about coming to grips with. Because the better we can handle that bereavement, I think the better we can go on with our lives, but also the better caregivers we could be. You know, in the chapter, speaking to that, living in the now, you write about your way of, your phrase, slaying the de dragon, choosing to see Elaine as the person she is now, the second Elaine. That's an interesting choice of phrase, and, and especially when you don't have the support, like you said, of someone who has a family they, where they su suffer an instant mortality. How did you slay the dragon day to day? Well, I'll tell you how not to do it. Um, all of the armies marching and all of the navies assailing and all of the beer brewed and all of the whiskey distilled uh, is not going to do it. It's not going to slay the dragon. And my daughter, Christine, gave me an article on moderate drinking. Oh, the and caregiver's it, poison, I think. Yeah, mon yeah. And, but, and she didn't give me the, the caregiver's poison, but she didn't give me the article on moderate drinking because I was drinking too little. You know, I'm just quite, quite the opposite. And so... Uh, I think it was certainly, um, I, I, I tell the story about the hippopotamus and the butterfly that fell in love. And they're going to get married and the hippopotamus is beginning to think about the consummation of the marriage. So he seeks out the wise owl and says, wise owl, I'm going to get married, we're going to have a honeymoon, you're going to con consummate the marriage. You can see that that's going to be really tough, what do I do? Well, the wise owl says, what you have to do is, is turn yourself into a butterfly. And so what happens is we turn, uh, Hippopotamus accepted that advice and, and walked away. And then it dawned on him this was pretty impossible. So he says, Wise Owl, how do I turn myself into a butterfly? Well, the Wise Owl says, get lost, Buster. I just determined policy. And so I mention that story because how, do I, how does one cope, you know, with, with the second Elaine? How do, you, how do you slay the dragon? This is policy because it's almost impossible. But to get to the point where you let go of the first Elaine. So if she doesn't know me anymore, that's okay, because I know that, that this is a different Elaine. 
if she doesn't recognize the family, if we're getting together at Christmas time and all of the family is there and she tugs my, my, my shirt and she says, who are these people? And let's go home. I don't want to be with these strangers. So, so you work on, on slaying the dragon by understanding more about the disease and you work on slaying the dragon by understanding that this wonderful human being still loves you in their own way and still tries to communicate with you in their own way and, and if at all possible to embrace that new person. And as you were saying, to still, to still have that connection and that hearts and souls touching that um, it, it, that part at least is not diminished by all the other trappings around it. That, right? And in fact, that really, when you say other trappings, basically there are no other trappings. I mean, that, that is what life is, is, is all about for us now, and that is for our hearts and souls to connect. You write in the book that uh, when your partner gets an Alzheimer's diagnosis, it's important to make a bucket list. And I'm wondering what was on yours, and if you could speak to that a little bit. Well, uh, what we did was uh, I always wanted to go, to, and this was an interesting thing, I always wanted to go to, uh, uh, down to Miami, Florida, and on the way back, and so we did that, but on the way back we stopped at friends' home who are friends since, since college, because this goes back to 1960, and so uh, we happened to see them, it was Elaine's closest friends, and we were able to uh, understand that we could have a good, you know, communication with them, but the bucket list just simply um, had us do, th making sure that we visited the grandchildren, making sure that we did all of the things that one would ordinarily put off in ordinary life because they're too busy. When you knew that the time had come for Elaine to live elsewhere, explain how the Alzheimer's Association assurance that you were not, quote, putting her someplace helped you with that decision. This question is one of the most important questions that we get in feedback sessions as I, I travel around the state and, and talk with, with different groups. There's so much guilt, but there's just so much self-pride about never putting their loved one in a nursing home or in assisted living. And I think that is a devastating downfall for the family as well as for the person with dementia. So. I'm visiting with my counselor, and I'd say, you know, I'm, my, my health is being dragged down. Um, I don't know how I can cope. I'm almost at wit's end. And so, you know, my friends are saying, you've got to do something. So I talked to the counselor. I cannot see putting Elaine into a home. And the emphasis, of course, being putting. And so she said, you're not putting Elaine any place. And she didn't come out and say that I was maybe self-centered and selfish and, and, and uh, of, uh, of a nature of being too much with pride. She didn't say that directly, but I, can be, I came to understand that. And, and what, what, I, what I came to understand is that maybe I was wanting to keep her for my own self-benefit because I could not feel bad about putting my wife into a home, again, putting. Well, Linda said, you're not putting your wife any place. What you're doing is you're giving her an opportunity to be who she is now. And there was no way that Marty Schreiber 24-7 nursing home facility could do anything to help Elaine be who she is now. And uh, we trained staff and uh, activities uh, going on, um, better meal preparation. Um, as I mentioned before, we would go out for a a walk, and we'd come back, and Elaine said, let's go for a walk, we'd go for a walk, she said, let's go, for, and, and that, so, so I am a better person and can give more to my children and grandchildren, and Elaine is happier because she has less anxiety because I feel less anxiety, and so um, I, I want to tell anyone that they cannot be fearful about giving their loved one an opportunity to be who they are now by admitting that they may not be able to give that kind of help. Uh, Marty, you, you don't go into too much detail in the book, but I could see that some of the other caregivers who are watching or listening would benefit from knowing more about how you chose a new home for Elaine. Um, a very important question, and I think the most immediate uh, response would be to understand the opposite of stone walls do not a prison make. In other words, if you are looking for uh, a, a, a living situation for your loved one. Uh, I think certainly when you visit, what you want to do 
is the nose test. What you know, just as simple as that. What is what is what is the aroma, you know, in in the facility, and to forget about the fact that there may be a crystal chandelier and 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 solid oak wood floors and so forth. The question is, as you walk through this facility, what are the programs that they have? Uh, take a look at that um, and sit down and have a, a meal and see once what the food is like. But then also see the, the, the personality and the characteristics of the person who is maybe in charge what kind of personality do they have? And then if that's a loving, caring personality, does that go to the people who are on the front lines? Right. And uh, I'm going to tell you that um, a caregiver, uh, a licensed nurse or a, a, you know, a, a, a caregiver is doing at a very, very modest pay what someone would not do for $200 an hour. But yet, they, many, give the kind of love and attention. And so when I have to say goodbye to Elaine, and one of the caregivers there can take Elaine's, okay, Elaine, you know, let's go. Let's, we're going to do just a little bit of a dance, or let's go. You can help me pour coffee or help. In, and, and giving Elaine a series, uh, not a series, but a feeling of worth in in, in the redirection. And so when one looks for uh, an opportunity for assisted living for a loved one, again, to, to look at what is, there's a sense and there's a feel and there's a smell test, I think, which is just most important looking at the activities. But then also, these homes are inspected by the state and there's certain rules and regulations they have to follow. They should have an inspection report available for one to look at. And if not, you can go to the Department of Health and be able to get a report on, on that. But uh, oh, my suggestion is to look at two or three of them and not go alone. Uh, because if, if I, for example, go and I know my, I, I'm a bias for, let's just pick one out, guitar playing. I just have a bias for guitar playing and I take, I'm looking for a place and there's some place there I go and someone's playing a guitar. I may say, well, that's the place for Elaine. Well, no, I've, I've got to be going with someone who can help me give these, these kinds of balances. And uh, that makes, and ask a lot of questions. Just ask, and if you can bump into some of the um, loved ones of the, of the people who are there mm -hmm. and say, how, are, how is it going? And, and again, you watch the interaction. And again, a lot of the behavioral issues sometimes come about because people don't understand the disease and they're not getting into the world with the person that has dementia. Sure. And if they don't understand it at that home, you know, um, that, that's tough. I, this is a quick story. Uh, a man comes across a body in the road. It's very seriously hurt. He gets on uh, the 911 and he says, you have to send help right away. He says, there's a body, he's very ill, very sick. And the dispatcher says, where are you? Well, he says, I'm on Pistachio Street. And he says, well, okay. He says, how do you spell Pistachio? He says, I don't know how to spell Pistachio. Send help right away. He says, I'm not going to send any help until you spell Pistachio because I've got to make sure it goes to the correct place. Well, he says, send help. I'm not going to send. Okay, he says, I'll call you back in five minutes. Well, call back in five minutes, says the dispatcher. How come call back in five minutes? Well, the man says, I'm going to drag the body over to Elm. And if, if the assisted living facility memory care does not know how to spell pistachio if they don't understand the disease and all of the different kind of variations of of helping through redirection or, or or therapeutic fibbing or joining the person's world if they don't understand it i think there's hell to pay uh, not only for the person with dementia but their family and even for the staff as well so you would recommend to anybody who's touring these communities to look into the training that the staff receives. It's very important that they get a sense of underst understanding the disease, yes. Well, to close today, Marty, uh, going back to the title of your book, My Two Elaine's Learning, Coping, and Surviving as an Alzheimer's Caregiver, that it seems to be a mantra in the book almost, learn, cope, and survive. And I, could you speak to those three words as, a, as the three ideas and why they're all connected and important? Sure. Well, let, let's. Um, let's go back to learning how to spell pistachio to learn more about the disease. 
And um, it's not anything to rejoice about, but uh, it, the learning comes uh, about with, again, rather than worrying about the storm to pass, to learn how to dance in the rain, to learn about the disease so you can, can help play a role with your loved one in, 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 in getting through this, this journey. Coping, my goodness, if, if I wouldn't have had an understanding of how to deal with some of these very frustrating aspects, um, I don't know how I would have ever be able to cope. And if you can't cope, you can't survive. And uh, anecdotally, there are, are any number of, of, of caregivers who have not survived and have gotten a heart attack before their, their time and who have deprived their family and friends and their loved one of an opportunity to take a leadership role or to be a caregiver and so forth. So surviving is, is quite important. Uh, just, just for the caregiver, but then, 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 then for all. But then also, I'm I'm thinking of of another another point, and that is thriving. I don't know how it's going to be possible to thrive, but I think we caregivers have to look at not only learning and coping and surviving, but also somehow or another thriving to begin to rebuild. And uh, thriving for me was. Uh, was writing the book. Yeah. Thriving for me is sitting here and talking with you about how we might be able to impact on people's lives to the positive. And so that's thriving for me. And um, another, another one of my brother caregivers uh, bought a little Springer Spaniel called Scooter. So his thriving is bringing this cute little puppy in, in, into the assisted living and, and, and the, the people love him, you know. Um, another caregiver is, uh, gets some puppets and, 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 and shows with puppets. But to somehow or another, we, again, I want to get back. If there's one thing worse than Alzheimer's, it's ignorance of the disease. Rather than worrying about the storm to pass, to learn how to dance, uh, in, in the rain, and again, that dancing in the rain is to learn about the disease, but try to figure out how, how a caregiver can not only survive, but thrive. Excellent. Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank my guest today, Martin Schreiber, former governor of Wisconsin and the author of Might and Virginia Plans. Thank you so much. Director of Sales for Dementia Care Services here at CPI. Martin's book, My Two Elaines. Learning, Coping, and Surviving as an Alzheimer's Caregiver is, is available on Amazon.com. There is also a website. My two Elaines, all one word, and uh, they might be able to order uh, through that website as well. But it's mytwoelanes.com, and again, all one word, two spelled out. Thank you for joining us today on Unrestrained. Tune in again soon for another interview with an expert in behavior management. Until then, this is your host, Terry Vitone, hoping your intention is prevention.